And good evening, and welcome to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, we appreciate you being here this evening and like to welcome all those that are tuning in by television or by radio or even by the internet. We thank you and hope that as we go in this week to the last part of the book of Revelation, we're looking at Revelation the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20, 21, and 22. Those chapters finishing up the book of Revelation. And so we hope that you can tune in each night as we take a look at what God is saying is happening today. Probably uh, these next few chapters are some of the most important in the book of Revelation. Uh, as you know, this will bring us to the end. We have covered the whole book of Revelation, and we hope it's been a particular blessing to you. As you remember, uh, we started out in the first part of Revelation, and in the fourth chapter, it says that John was caught up to the throne of God, to the throne room, and there in the throne room was angels, 24 elders, and four living creatures, and we've tried to illustrate that for you, and we've uh, had some things here that we hope maybe illustrated them for you. Uh, those four living creatures, uh, they're part of the angelic host. Uh, they're seraphims because they have six wings. And these uh, four living creatures depict the nature of Christ. It's what they're to do. For instance, it says that one of them was like a lion. And, of course, you remember the Scripture says that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And these living creatures are not something new. You find them even in the Old Testament. You find that the children of Israel carried banners that had pictures of these four living creatures on them. Uh, the next one, it tells us, was like an ox. And, of course, that represented the sacrifice that Christ would make in your behalf and mine. And so it's pictured him as the sacrifice. And then you find that it talks about the third living creature, and it says that that third one was like a man representing the humanity of Christ. And pictures that. And then the fourth one was like an eagle. And that eagle represented the divinity of Christ. And so you have those four living creatures. We've tried to give you a little idea of what was there. All the visions that John had all took place in the throne room. And as you read through the book of Revelation, you'll see it talks about 24 elders or the angels or the four living creatures being there. This was where John was, and this is where he saw many of the things that are recorded in the book of Revelation. So we hope that that will bless you as we continue to study the book of Revelation. Uh, tonight, we're taking a look at the 17th chapter and the Scarlet Beast. Scarlet Beast. Uh, there are beasts that are used throughout the book of Revelation. Probably to understand this one will help you put the whole thing together. So we hope it'll bless you particularly as we study it. Uh, tomorrow night we're going to be talking about ten kings because in the 17th chapter it talks about ten kings and the part that they will play in the very last days. You've got to remember the 17th chapter is wrapping it up. This is, this is really where it wraps all of it up as far as the beast and all are concerned. And so the ten kings... Uh, are there. It says they give their power and authority to the beast, so you want to be with us as we talk about these ten kings on our next presentation. And then, of course, tonight we're back to the scarlet beast, so we hope that that will bless you as we continue to study God's Word. Uh, tonight, uh, Donna Klein is going to sing for us one of the great, as far as I'm concerned, Christmas carols. One that I hope that will bless you in a special way, entitled, 
on a silent night, and you'll be blessed in a special way. But before she does, Chuck Algar is going to come, and he's going to read with you the scripture that we're going to be looking at tonight. So follow in your Bible, or follow it on the screen. We hope it'll bless you. Good evening. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn them to the book of Revelation. And we're going to go through Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. Let's read together. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having on her in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. And the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has ten, seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. May God add his blessing to his word. To many people, the 17th chapter of Revelation is a puzzle. They just can't seem to make all the pieces fit. And so they read the 17th chapter and they give up. They say, well, I don't understand what it's talking about. It's all Greek to me. I don't know what, what, what it's dealing with. And they give up. But really, the 17th chapter is one of the great chapters in the book of Revelation. So get your Bible, get your uh, pencil and paper, and we're going to take a look tonight at this beginning of this 17th chapter and see if we can't put all these different pieces of the puzzle in place so that you'll understand what it's talking about. So let's go there and take a look at what the Scripture has to say here. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So here we have this woman sitting on the beast, has seven heads, ten horns. Now you'll find that in Bible prophecy, a woman consistent folks all the way through scripture a woman in bible prophecy will represent a church it'll represent a spiritual power and you have several texts that gives you that key to help you understand that like this one in jeremiah it says i have likened the daughter of zion to a lovely and delicate woman and so he compares a church to a woman. You have another text here in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for her, and he doesn't leave you in doubt here. Paul makes it clear what he's talking about because he goes on and says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church so he talks about the relationship here and you'll find that as you read through God's word you'll find that it always refers to the church as she and it all re always refers to civil power as he makes that distinction so you don't have to be in doubt as to what it's talking about so you have in Revelation the 12th chapter you have a woman here again. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, on her head a garland of twelve stars. This woman 
is a good woman. It talks about what, what she does, and it says she's clothed the sun. This represented the early church back in the first part when the church was being formed as it came out of Judaism. It represents the early church, and it says she's clothed with the sun, which represented the gospel, says the moon under her feet, which represented the Old Testament period she's coming out of, says she has on her head a garland of 12 stars that represented the 12 apostles that Christ had given the commission to to take the gospel to the world. So this is a good woman. You go to Revelation 17, and you have a woman just the opposite, riding on a beast because it says... Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying to me, Come, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So here you have a woman that is just the opposite, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So it carried me away in the spirit and in the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So if I have a good woman in Revelation, the 12th chapter, that represents what? A good church. If I have a bad woman represented in Revelation, the 17th chapter, that represents a bad church. That simple, not difficult. One represents a good woman, a good church. Another one represents a bad church. All right, let's go on. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abomination, the filthiness of her fornication. Please notice, folks, that pomp, ceremony, and show does not necessarily mean godliness. Did you follow me? Just because it may look good just because it may have a lot of splendor doesn't make it right. Okay? So she, clothed, if you please, with purple and scarlet and gold and precious stones, pearl, she has all that. But something wrong inside. On her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon, the Great, the mother of harlots of the abominations of the earth. This woman is contrary to what God would have her to be. She is not what he wants her to be. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So he sees this woman, looks at her. John cannot put it together marvels with great amazement that how this woman who represents the church could be all this. So tonight, what you and I have to do is we want to identify who is this woman. That's, we need to have that clear. Who does this woman represent so that we know exactly what it's talking about? I'm going to give you four points of identification, and that will identify exactly who it's talking about you and I don't have to be in doubt. God is not putting you in a place where you can't understand it. This piece of the puzzle, folks, fits perfect. There'll be no problem here. First point, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. Therefore, since it says the kings of the earth committed fornication with her, she has to be a world power. You can't go off over here and find some little church in the corner somewhere and put that application to it. It has to be a church that has been involved with the kings of the world because it says, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. In other words, they've been involved with her. That's what it's talking about. So one point, she has to be a world power. Well, when you start looking at churches that are world powers there's not very many and it's very very clear that when it's talking about this it narrows it down to that of the papacy papal power 
Today, her membership is over 1 billion. Spread across the earth. Watch what it says here. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You can't go over here and find a church folk that has a few hundred members or a few thousand over in some part country and apply it. You've got to have a church that covers the world because the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So it can't be just some little power somewhere. It's got to be a worldwide power. It's got to be a power that has had enough influence that the inhabitants of the earth have been affected by what she had to say. It says they've been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And any time the Scripture's talking about the wine of fornication, it's talking about belief. It's talking about what she is giving the people. And that represents the wine of her fornication, his false belief that she has led them contrary to God's word. Third point, persecuting power. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the martyrs of Jesus. So this woman that is setting on this beast has to be a power that has persecuted. She has to be somebody that has persecuted God's people. And so we ask, has she done this? Well, history's full of it. All you have to do is go back and read. And if you read, you'll see very clear that when it says that she has persecuted God's people, indeed she has. Go back, folks, and pick up some books at the library. Pick up Fox Book of Martyrs. Or read short, short stories of the Reformation. Or Here I Stand by Bainton. Or if you're really into reading it, read The History of the Reformation by D'Aubigny. All those will tell you all that she has done and the many, many people that she's persecuted. I don't care whether you're talking about the Spanish Inquisition or if you're talking about the persecution of the Waldensian people or you're talking about that of the Huguenots. It's all there. Listen to what this historian says about the persecution, what they did to the people. Many, many people gave their lives. I'm not talking about a few. I'm talking about thousands upon thousands of thousands down through the age that gave their life for what they believed. This is by Licky. The history and the rise of the influence of the spirit of rationalism in Europe. The Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind. I'll let that soak in just a little bit. Has shed more blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. And so history tells us clearly she has done just that. So if you're starting to look at and want to know who is this woman... One, she has to be a worldwide power. Two, she has to have influenced the inhabitants of the earth with her beliefs. She had to be a persecuting power. And four, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. What do we have here? Very simple. This woman who represents a church, represents a spiritual power, I should say, is setting on a beast which represents a civil power. So if you have a woman setting on a beast, you have uniting of church and state. That's what you have. And this represents a union of church and state. And I'll come back to this point in, in a little bit. But when you have a woman sitting on it, that means that she controls it. You follow me? If you're riding a horse, who controls it? The rider. 
If a woman's sitting on the beast, that means she's controlling it. It means that she has taken over state power. So this represents the uniting of church and state. Those four points identify for you clearly exactly who this woman represents. You and I don't have to be in doubt about it, friends. It's clear from God's Word. Setting on a scarlet beast, we need to identify who is this scarlet beast that she's setting on. Who does it represent? Who, who is this power? Well, let's see what the Scripture says about it. And I saw three unclean spirits. How many? Three. All right. Like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So the Bible tells you clearly, here's three frogs, which are demons, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. Who are they? For they are the spirits of demons. All right, what are they going to do? Performing signs, performing wonders, performing miracles, if you please, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So you have three. You have three powers here. You have the dragon, you have the beast, and you have the false prophet. What are these? What do they represent? What do they mean? Dragon. The dragon throughout the scripture in Revelation, the 12th chapter, clearly is portrayed as that of paganism. It was the power of paganism. So it's saying out of paganism came this frog, which is the spirit of demons. Also, the false, well, let's go to the beast first. The beast we've just talked about, the beast is the same as that of Revelation 13, which represented that of the papacy or Catholicism, if you please. And then it says the false prophet, which is pictured in Revelation the 13th chapter as the beast there with the two horns, which represented that of Protestantism. And so you have coming out of these, out of the dragon, out of the beast, and out of the false prophet, these frogs, which are demons, and it means that Catholicism, Protestantism, and paganism have united, folks. That's what it means. They have united, and they've gone out together, the kings of the earth, to bring them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. This is what it's trying to tell us and get across to us. Listen to what it says here. This is all in the 17th chapter. The great harlot who what? Sits on many waters. Waters in Bible prophecy represent people, nations, tongue. If she is setting on the waters... It means that she is controlling it. Second point, saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. It means that she is controlling this beast. She is controlling civil power. I, I hope you're getting the picture. What it's trying to tell you is paganism, Protestantism, Catholicism have united... And that spiritual concept or trinity has come together and they are now controlling the civil powers of the world. The third point, seven mountains on which the woman what? Sits. And as you read through there, seven mountains represent kingdoms. So it's meaning that this woman is in control. That's what it's talking about. So what's going to happen? With whom the kings of the earth, what? Committed fornication. That means that they're in bed with her. That means that she 
is involved with them, that they are in this whole thing together. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So she, in this thing that she has put together, and I'm going to talk about it here in a minute, these concepts that she's put together, she has made the world drunk with the wine of her fornication. They have accepted what she is giving. They are following it. They are believing it. And the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abomination, the filthiness of her fornication. She's telling what she is, what she is doing. All right. Satan's deception regarding the Scripture. Now, you've got to do a little thinking here. Uh, I, you know, let's turn the wheels a little bit and, and do a little thinking. What belief, what belief is there that dr paganism and Catholicism and Protestantism could all come together on and follow and believe? Natural immortality of the soul. That when you die, you don't really. You just go to another existence. The immortality of the soul, folks, the natural immortality of the soul idea comes directly, directly from paganism. That's where it had its root. It was given to Catholicism. Catholicism embraced it and brought it into the church as a belief of the church, and then it was handed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism, and they took a hook, line, and seeker, and so today you have Paganism, Catholicism, Protestantism, all uniting around the idea of the immortality of the soul. Drunk with the wine of her fornication. Sunday sacredness. Go back, read it. I mean, you can read it in the encyclopedia, folks. You don't have to read it in Scripture. It comes straight from paganism. There is no scripture basis for Sunday sacredness. None at all. That is something that the pagans believed. The pagans were worshipers of the sun. They worshipped it as their god. And again, it was something that was handed by paganism, if you please, to Catholicism. And Catholicism taken it and actually enforced it on the people and then as time passed took and gave it to Protestantism and Protestantism accepted it. Does not have any basis in Scripture. I'm just telling you something they unite on, folks. They All three come together on. Eternal torment does not come from Scripture. Eternal torment idea comes from paganism. It's where it started. And then we get into the Catholicism in the church, and they want to put out things such as Dante's Inferno. And Protestantism wants to accept it. So when it says that she has made them drunk with the wine of her fornication, it means that they are uniting in these things that they can agree upon, and as they come together, they'll work together to produce what they consider or what the Scripture refers to as Babylon. Confusion. It's not clear. Have you ever tried to Reason with a drunk man? If they're drunk with the wine of her fornication? 
All right, it says, and here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Here is the mind that has wisdom. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other's not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. Now, this is the place where many people get lost in the 17th chapter of Revelation. And you've got to follow me carefully here. There are also how many kings? Seven. Five are fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. It is rather interesting that in Scripture that it would use exactly the same phrase in the 13th chapter and in the 17th chapter and concerning understanding this. Revelation 13, 18 says, Here is a mind that has what? Wisdom. Revelation 17, 9 says, Here is a mind that has wisdom. God uses that phrase and very, very important because many of the things in the 13th chapter apply to the 17th chapter. Okay, let's watch as it puts it together. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Now, John is saying that he was carried away where? Into the wilderness. Okay, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So here, in vision, in the spirit, John has been carried into the... Got to be with me. Carried into where? Into the wilderness. Okay, that's where he's been carried. And the beast that you saw was... Okay, and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. Now I said the beast that you saw was, is not. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was, is not, and yet is. So we've got a beast here, folks, that was, is not, yet it is. All right, now, if you're going to understand this 17th chapter of Revelation... You can't, you've got to understand exactly where John is. If you don't understand where John is, you'll never understand it. So John said, where was he? He was in the wilderness. He was not in vision. He had been carried into the wilderness. So John is seeing this beast in the wilderness, folks. You cannot look at this from John being on the island of Patmos. Or you can't look at this prophecy from our day. You've got to look at it from where John is. And John is in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he sees, the, sees this beast that was, is not, yet is. Okay, so if I'm talking about a beast that was, what tense is that? That's past. Now, that's a beast that was past. Okay? Secondly, is not. Is not has to be present because we're looking at this from John's point of view. And in the wilderness, it is not. So that's present. And yet is would be future. Okay, so we, get it, we need to be clear. This beast was not, or was, in the past it was, 
It is not in John's day, and yet is in the future. All right, let's see if we can put it together. Here is a mind that has wisdom. Seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. That is simply saying these are civil powers in which the woman rules over them. She's been over them. She's char in charge of them. There are also seven kings. All right, be clear. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. Now, don't mix it up here. Don't get mixed up. We're talking now about seven kings. We're not talking about the beast. The beast was, is not, yet is. But these seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other is yet to come. And you've got to look at this from John's position in the wilderness. You can't look at it from your position. You've got to look at it from his position in the wilderness. So in the wilderness... John is saying, here are five kings that have fallen. One is ruling now, and the other is yet to come. That's what John is saying. Okay, let's continue on. When he comes, the last one, he will continue a short time. The beast that was, we're back to the beast. The beast that was, and is not, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. So he's given you all the pieces of the puzzle, folks. And they may all be laid out there, but they're all there, and you and I just have to put them in place, and we can see exactly what it's talking about. Well, when you pick up the Bible and it talks about a beast... And it says this beast has seven heads. You'll find that the scripture tells you there are certain beasts that it is given that represents different powers. And so if you go back to the book of Daniel and Revelation, you'll find seven of them that are listed, which are very interesting. You start out, Daniel, the seventh chapter, and you have a lion, which represented the kingdom of Babylon. That lion was overthrown by another beast. Remember? And that beast was a bear, represented Medo-Persia. Please notice, folks, that Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. And then we find that a third one comes on the scene of action, which was a... Leopard, which represented Greece. And we find that Greece overthrew Medo-Persia. In other words, it fell. Medo-Persia fell to Greece. And then we find that a fourth beast comes on the scene of action, which was Rome, pagan Rome. Greece fell to pagan Rome. And then we find in Revelation the... 13th chapter, we have another beast, and we find that pagan Rome fell to papal Rome. Five have fallen. There they are. As John is there in the wilderness and looking at it, he said, here's five of them that have fallen. Okay. One is, now you've got to remember, folks, John is in vision. He's seeing things. And in vision, he's saying, one is, and he calls that what? Calls it a wilderness. And the reason he calls it a wilderness is because this is the time that atheistic communism is ruling. This was a time when they said there is no God and threw God out. And it was a wilderness as far as John is concerned. This is the one that is ruling at that time. And then he said, 
One is yet to come. Well, atheistic communism ruled to about 1991. And then all of a sudden we found another power that came to the ascendancy more than ever before, and that was the two-horned beast of Revelation 13. And the other's not yet come. When he comes, he will continue a short time. The United States rose to a place that it had never been before. And never like before, it began to speak as a dragon. And you and I today are living in the time that it is speaking as a dragon. Richard Nixon, when he retired, or should I say forced to retire, he wrote a book. The book he wrote was entitled Seize the Moment. Read what the subtitle says. America's challenge in a one superpower world. In other words, all of a sudden the United States found itself in the position of being a superpower and the only superpower in the world. It came to ascendancy and there it was and it reached its power and from that point has begun to speak as a dragon. This is what is taking place. Five have fallen. One is. One was yet to come. And dear friend, tonight, you are living in the time of the last beast. Don't fool yourself. There's not any more. This is the last one. We've gone through six of them. We're down to the last one. The next thing that's going to happen will, become the, will be the coming of Jesus Christ. The beast that was and is not is himself also the what? The eighth. And is of the seven and is going to perdition. So it's saying that this beast that was, the scarlet beast, that was, is not, yet is, that beast is number eight. Strange. He's not only number eight, but he is of the seven. So no point, no point going out here looking for him some other place other than these seven. Because it's very clear that he is of the seven, but he's also the eighth. That's what the scripture is telling you and me. Eight points that tell you exactly who this beast is. One is of the seven. So that limits it. It's got to be one of those seven. The beast that was... You know what that just did? Well, the beast that was means it has to be some of those that were in the past. Can't be present. Has to be in the past. Also, that beast had to be one that there was a time in which it is not because it was, is not. So when you're looking at those seven, you've got to find a beast that was back there and that there was a time in which it was not. Eh? Is not. Is himself also the eighth. In other words, what it's saying is this beast had to be one of the seven, and there was a time in which it didn't exist, but yet it is coming back to power. 
what it's telling you. Had to make war with the saints. Had to be a persecuting power. Required to be a persecuting power. Had to be the uniting of church and state. Are you getting the picture? I mean, it lines all these points up telling you exactly who this beast is. And it says the uniting of church and state. It had to receive a deadly wound because that is what made it not exist. Is not. That deadly wound had to be healed. When the deadly wound was healed, all the world wandered after the beast. Dear friends, the scripture identifies clearly that beast to be that of papal Rome. And it says that it will come back to the ascendancy and with the uniting, follow me carefully here, with the uniting of paganism and Catholicism and Protestantism, you have what the Scripture refers to as Babylon. That is the woman, Babylon, riding on this beast right down at the end of time. Now, there's other players involved here. And there's other players that are going to enter into this as we take a look at the 18th chapter. But some of those players are ten kings. The ten horns, which you saw, are what? Ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the what? With the beast. So this beast, power, is coming to power, and it says that these kings are going to rule with the beast. They are of one mind, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So this beast power is going to go clear to the end of time. Ten kings are going to join and they're going to give their power and authority to this beast. Now the interesting thing about that, folks, is it says in Revelation 13 that this two-horned beast that we just found out represents the United States, that that two-horned beast also will make an image to the beast. So what you have here is you have the beast, you have ten kings, and you have the United States all giving their power and authority to the beast. Please notice these are all civil powers and the woman, which is Babylon, rules over them. So you don't want to miss as we take a look at the ten kings in our next presentation. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity you give us to understand what your word teaches. Open our minds. Help us to be clear. And we pray, Lord, as we understand the times in which we're living, that Jesus will be coming soon, that we're down to the very end of Scripture, the last beast. There's not another one. May our hearts be surrendered to you, and may we desire above everything else to follow you. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for being with us. We hope you'll continue at, stay with us as we go through the book of Revelation. God bless you. Have a great evening. Good night.